Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's Saturday. Ooh. All right, let's try that again. Uh, I think the computer just had to catch up. Um, good morning, and welcome to today's Saturday live stream. Uh, I am going to be continuing uh, through uh, Blacker's Flies for the River Ban. Uh, we're going to be doing number one today, and um, yeah. Again, tying on these uh, Partridge, uh, what is it, CS26 hooks um, that were kindly provided to me uh, at last weekend's uh, Thai Fest show. And uh, yeah, uh, again, I'm tying out of my copy of Blacker's Art of Fly Making. And um, just... Uh, oh, before we get started, a few announcements. One, just a reminder, over on my Instagram, I will be doing a giveaway when I reach 500, uh, 500 followers. And uh, we're about 435 right now, 430 something. Uh, and again, that giveaway will be not just a giveaway, but uh, I'll be running a competition uh, for those flies. Uh, they are fishing quality uh, most of them will be Mary Orvis Marbury flies. And uh, so that's going on. And then what else? Um, also a reminder, I will be tying at the Maryland uh, Fly Fishing and Collectible Tackle Show. Um, say that 10 times fast. Uh, and that will be <clears throat> March 14th uh, on the campus of Towson University. Uh, up by Baltimore. Uh, it's just a single day show. And so uh, it's just that Saturday. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have a table and I'll be displaying some flies and I'll be doing some demonstrations. So I uh, hope to see you there. And uh, yeah. Uh, also, I'm recovering from a little bit of illness this week. So you know, if I start to lose my voice or if I have to cough or sneeze, I, I apologize in advance. Okay, so <clears throat> Blackers, number one for the River Band. Uh, the uh, in in my uh, 1993 reprint of the pattern, it reads number one, or the flies suit to suit the band are as follows: number one, body claret pig hair ribbed with gold tinsel, orange tag, a topping, and a little wood duck for tail. A dark claret hackle rolled up to the shoulder and a blue jay above it. Mallard wings mixed with bustard. The dark small spotted bustard feather is best for this river. The light color colored for Scotland and Wales. Golden pheasant tail and neck. Peacock wing. Wood duck. Feelers of blue and yellow macaw and a black head. Hook number eight or nine. This is a great favorite. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, um, like most of Blacker's uh, recipes, uh, it's written not in the way that we today traditionally think of it. So whenever you see a recipe like in a, in a fly book, uh, a book of flies or in a magazine, usually it's um, written in the order in which things are tied on. Um, this is... This particular description is a little bit more all over the place, but um, in general, Blacker tends to describe things either front to back or back to front, or if he's describing uh, the way in which it's tied on, sometimes the wing is tied on before everything else. Uh, so um, as I've described before. So yeah, the description is a little bit... Uh, we have to work with it. And also in this reprint, it's missing a lot of the punctu punctuation. Um, and so for example, um, in the wing, it says there's no comma between wood duck and feelers. So it reads wood duck feelers, a blue and yellow macaw. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, that is hilarious to someone I'm sure. Um, right. So let's see. So trying to keep, remember what order things go on is a little bit tricky or can be a little bit tricky with, if you're just reading uh, straight out of the blacker book. 
uh, like I am. So let's see, orange tag, there's no tip. So just an orange tag. Uh, I'm gonna start my thread, but I've, I'm going to just give it one a single layer all the way down to where I'm gonna tie in the tag. I'm just gonna tie the tag in. Well, I will probably come, yeah. Because this is a black um, black hook shank, I probably will give it give the the tag an under underbody. Um, I don't want much of an underbody because this is a light wire hook. I want the body to be pretty skinny, um, and the wing is going to be fairly sparse. And by fairly sparse, I mean it's probably going to be two fibers of each component, except the mallard. Um, two fibers of each component for each side so four four for each component total uh again because this is a light wire hook i want to tie this fly relatively sparse and the body is going to be relatively skinny uh just like the other flies in the series that i've tied but i am going to make a fairly long tag long skinny tag um just because i can and again, um, when I'm measuring the tip and tag, the tip and tag usually fall between the on the hook shank, the portion corresponding to the the length of the point to barb. Um, so if you can see, I, I'm using a thread to measure here. My thread is sitting right at the point of the barb and the space. And then I'm going to wind the the tag in this case without tip. Um, start it at the point of the hook wind it down wind it back and that'll be the tag now you don't have to do it that way um, i know a lot of people like to run their tip and tag further down the hook um, i just think it's more it's a more well i won't say proportional but in my opinion it's just kind of a more elegant uh proportioning uh i, th uh, I i've said this a lot about the wings but uh, oftentimes it's true about the bodies. Salmon flies are, in my opinion, frequently over tied for the hooks. Um, they can be just way too heavy on the hook, way too tall. Yeah. And sure, some of the big, like, you know, 30 fiber wings are, you know, cool to look at, but they just overbalance the hook. The hook is a big part of the fly. Uh, not only determines the shape of the fly and the proportions, uh, but it also determines, you know, how, how relevant everything that goes on it looks. Uh, and if you tie a, a fly too big on it or too heavy on it, uh, I think you're just kind of discounting that. And that's, uh, Sad, especially uh, if, you know, for a lot of these people who are putting a lot of time and effort into handmade hooks, uh, I like the hook to, to shine as much on the fly, <clears throat> you know, as anything else. Um, so. Now, a floss tag without a tip is a little bit tricky just because um, the floss likes to spread out and, you know, it's nice the floss spreads out to go on, not go on flat, but then also, you know, it can spread out too much on the hook and just cause a little bit of extra bulk to build up in a place where you might not want it. Now, this, I am going to use... Um, uh, because it does call specifically for claret pig hair, um, I am going to be dubbing this body, so I'm not going to be too concerned about how uh, smooth my underbody is. But again, I want a nice thin or skinny body, uh, so I'm going to try and keep the bulk underneath to a minimum, although there will need to be some just to make sure it, it tapers appropriately. Uh, okay, a topping and a little wood duck for the tail. I happen to have a prepared topping from my mishap on Wednesday. Uh, 
where I tried to t- where I started to tie in a golden pheasant tail, golden pheasant tip uh, topping tail onto a fly that called for not a golden pheasant topping tail. Actually, I don't like the. Um, and you can change the curvature of your tails just a little bit. I, I want to flatten this tail out a little bit. Um, the, the stem's already been flattened from the, the preparation I did on Wednesday. But instead of like having too much bend in it, I want this, this tail to be pretty flat um, to match the style of the others that I've tied from the series, but also um, just to uh, help kind of make the fly look a little bit more streamlined. Again, this is a light wire hook. So everything I want to do is is kind of like it look uh, very, very kind of sparse Um, and a very curved tail. uh, In my opinion, doesn't help the illusion of sparseness on the hook. Okay. And then little wood duck for the tail almost always means barred wood duck uh blacker um is pretty good about calling out for uh unbarred wood duck if that's what he wants i think there are a few patterns that that he asks for that but And just because this is the tail, I'm going to take some of the shorter fibers closer to the tip of the feather and save the rest for the wing. We just need a few from each side. Nothing. These are pretty, pretty skinny slips. We'll put them back to back. Okay, so put them back to back. And I'm actually going to line up the bars. The tips aren't quite perfectly aligned. This isn't quite a, a great pair. pair. But I'm going to, instead of lining up the tips, I'm going to line up the white bars because the white bars um, are, are kind of the most visible part. So. Just gonna soft loop it on. Uh, just gonna check the thing. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to wax my thread as usual. Uh, let's see if I put my wax. There's my wax. Hmm. Okay, sorry for that. So I'm just getting over a little bit of a cold. Uh, and all this extra fluff again because I'm uh, dubbing the body. Uh, I'm just going to bind all this extra loose ends down with a quick open pass of wax thread. That'll just help control the fuzzies and. and uh, settle everything under the hook. Um,
you'll see me twist. So when I tie things down, you'll see me, you know, twisting things like this. And all I'm doing is just trying to make sure that everything, you know, lays straight on top or, you know, wherever it's placed on the hook. Uh, because as you wrap, things will want to have a tendency to twist in the direction that you're wrapping. And um, that's not always what you want. Uh, Now, um, I've said this in the past, but uh, waxing your thread when you bind things down like this um, does a couple of things. Uh, the first and foremost is it, it controls the, the fuzz, the extra fuzz, because the, the wax thread will do a pretty good job of trapping like, you know, you know any, any fuzz you get from the floss uh, or feathers underneath. The other thing that it does is it, provides like a tacky uh, base to the dubbing. So the body is, you know, when you, when you dub the body, the thread is tacky, but then also so is the body. And that just helps. And you just kind of sandwich the, the dubbing fibers between the body and the, the thread. Uh, and that helps to uh, just, you know, more securely hold them, especially if you're not doing like a dubbing loop uh, type of uh, dubbing technique. Now, I do happen to have some dark claret pig's wool. Um, this is uh, pig's wool that's dyed by Bill Bailey uh, and sold um, through... Uh, John McLean at feathersmc.com. Uh, it's really kind of neat stuff. It's pretty coarse. Um, it's interesting that uh, he calls that Blacker calls for this particular material on flies, which are tied fairly small. Uh, so, um, but it is very coarse. It's and and pigs wool actually comes from woolly pigs. Um, there are pigs that are, have grown kind of longer, more bristly, but curly hair. So it's not like, so it's a little bit more like uh, coarse sheep's wool rather than kind of the bristly, the straighter bristles that you would find like normally on a domestic, domestic pig. Um, yeah, it's really interesting stuff. <laughs> All right, uh, oh, that's a little bit. Well, I'm just going to pull a little bit off because I only want to dub about a fifth of this body before I tie in the hackle. All right, so I'm going to. Um, and Pig's Will is because it's such a coarse dubbing to work with can be a little bit more difficult to get to dub properly but like with all things more wax equals more success you should get t-shirts that say that right So claret body hackle. Uh, again, normally, normally I make the assumption that lacquer is rolling or winding the hackle over the entire body, but um, my modern sensibilities uh, kind of inform my decision. Or, uh, because of my modern sensibilities, I'm kind of choosing to wind the hackle from the first turn of rib. Um, rather than over the entire body. And also, uh, it just kind of makes it a little bit easier to be cl tied cleanly. And um, it also helps be a little bit more sparse, which is good for the style of the hook. So... One thing I will say about these partridge hooks is they are very nicely sharpened. 
My fingers will attest to that. Um, trying to be pretty sparing with this pig's wool. Um, you get these little tiny bags <laughs> in the assortment. And, uh, you know, it's not inexpensive. Also, this stuff is just really coarse, so it, it does pay to to work in several sections uh, as you dub the body, and to use lots of wax. Oop. The nice thing about pig's wool, though, is because again it's so coarse, it does give a nice kind of. Uh, bushy body um, without too much too much effort and I am going to dub just the tiniest bit more like another sixteenth of an inch of body because that's a little bit too much uh, space at the head there yeah, um, yeah, I don't want to crowd the eye too much, but I also don't want to leave too much bare shank. So I think like another two or three turns of dubbing. Okay, make that four. Okay, that's actually pretty good. All right, so now I'm going to wind the rib. I'm just using um, uh, embossed gold tinsel. Uh, this is a uh, antique tinsel. Um, this is actually from the. I think it was called the Antique Tinsel Company up in New York City. You can purchase um, uh, like a variety pack. Comes with I think eight spools, maybe maybe only six now, of vintage tinsels. Uh, you know, uh, usually it's some kind of. Uh, let's see, the variety pack I got was. Like some couple of embossed tinsels, flat tinsels, and gold and silver, and then I think uh, uh, a nice medium oval tinsel, um, one that I particularly like because it's got the core still showing. And uh, what was the other one? Um, I think the gold had like a fine round tinsel, and the silver had like a three strand silver lace, which was really nice. Uh, so yeah, those stencils are very nice. So time to wind the hackle. Uh, I'm going to fold it as usual, just sweeping the fibers rearward. Um, and for these flies, uh, I think I mentioned this in some of my other videos, but these flies. Um, tying on this size of hook and wanting to tie sparsely, uh, you definitely want to tie using a rooster hackle, like a neck hackle, and not like a schloppen or a saddle, uh, just because, um, you know, the spikiness is, one, appropriate, and two, uh, this, the, the lack of webbing uh, is just, uh, helps keep the, the hackle from being, you know, too dense. OK, 
Okay. Again, just going to tie it off at the at the at the head without making an extra turn. Um, again, to keep bulk down. And then let's see the um, throat is a J hackle. Jackals. Let me just find a nice one that looks to be about the right length. Yeah. All right. So here's the here's the J. Now, um, obviously, on this J hackle. Um, the only one side of the feather has the blue barring that we want. So we'll just strip the one side and we'll only wrap it as a single sided hackle. Um, obviously it means the, the hackle will be a little bit less dense, but you know, it's just there really the J hackle you're looking for just the, like the barest suggestion of that bright kind of pop of bright blue uh, at the throat. I'm just going to bind it down with a little bit of wax thread just to keep it from slipping out while I ruined it. Um, now, I want, I, I, I want, I do want to point out that I start my J hackle at on the side facing me. So then when I wrap it, one full turn brings it back to me. And that way I can get two full turn, two full turns and have two full turns underneath because um, otherwise uh, you could end up with you know, not quite enough underneath. Yeah, so like when I tie it off, uh, so that was one full turn, two full turns, and then when I tie it off um, also on the side towards me, um, that way I have the fullest amount of hackle underneath, you know, possible. Um, and you only get a couple of turns out of J hackles because um, the stems are so incredibly thick. Uh, they can add bulk to a head really quick. And so there's kind of a sweet spot of about two turns. All right. Uh, just going to bind down the, the ends here. It's going to build up a little bit of bulk right in front of the J hackle. That way, the wing doesn't have to clear the the rachis of the the hackle quite so much. Uh, it doesn't quite have so far to go. Again, because the these these the stems on J feathers tend to be pretty thick or tend to taper a lot, and so by the time you tie it off uh, after wrap a few wraps, it can be pretty thick. Um, there's some techniques where you can like take the ragus after you strip off one side of the fibers you can like scrape it down with a an exacto knife or a or a safety razor um and i've done that before and it it's just a lot it's just a headache to do it every time you want to tie in a j hackle um and since i'm not too worried about bulk at the head of the fly because i'm gonna add a, a hurl head at, at the end um it's not such a, a big deal to me okay so now we are here with the wing 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out all the components for the right and left wing. I'm going to bundle them together, put them back to back, and tie everything on all at once. Everything except... Except probably the wood duck and the macaw feelers. I think I'm going to, um, just to mirror the wood duck and the tail, I'm going to leave the wood duck and the wing unmixed. Um, also because just kind of as a nod to the fact that the way it reads in the description, because it's missing either a semicolon or a comma in the, in the recipe as printed. Um, it looks like it's intending for the wood duck to be feelers. Um, even though the feelers are obviously the blue and yellow macaw, uh, I'm going to leave the wood duck whole, um, just kind of as a, an homage to that misprint or the typo. So anyway, uh, I got my usual stack of uh, brown mallard. And I really ought to establish a few good pairs, but I use so much of this stuff, it's hard to just keep pairs paired on a consistent basis. I'm pretty sure bronze mallard or you know, brown mallard is probably the most commonly used material in fly wings or in classic fly wings. Um, if it's not part of the main wing, it's part of a you know the roof bronze mallard over. Um, you know, that or it's like, you know, some form of golden pheasant, I'm sure, uh, is also fairly common. But. So the only thing I'm going to use a fairly large chunk of is the bronze mallard because, one, it's a bronze mallard centered wing. Uh, and two, the bronze mallard of all of the materials that I'll be using is the one that's most likely to be lost. Uh, in the mix. So I'm going to use a couple of fairly hefty chunks, one left, one right. And I, I'm just laying them out um, in front of me, uh, left, right. Uh, and and um, <clears throat> again, this is not a married wing. This is a mixed wing. So I'm just going to lay the strips out next to each other and then bundle them all up and tie them on. Uh, it's very, very simple, very easy method of wing construction. Uh, and I'm going to use, I, I said I was going to use only two fibers of each, but I think I'm going to use three. Uh, uh, of all the... Uh, Non mallard, and I'll probably use a, f a few extra on the uh, tippet as well, the the golden pheasant neck feather, uh, just because that's a, that, that'll be tied in a little bit short relative to everything else. Golden pheasant tail. So, all right, and uh, this is the darkest speckled bustard I have. Um, it's fairly dark. Uh, it's not the darkest I've seen. Um, but this is some very nice uh, Cory bustard um, from the uh, species survival program. Um, something I keep forgetting to, to, to talk about. Uh, the species, the Cory bustard species survival program is a partnership between uh, feather distributors. So John McLean at feathersmc.com 
uh, is or was at least. I don't. I, I haven't quite asked. The, I I haven't heard any updates about the status of the program, but um, at, at the very least, uh, uh, as far as I know, John's still one of the distributors. But essentially, um, how it works is that. Uh, Cory Bustard feathers are collected from specimens at zoos around the country, and they are distributed for free to people who have made, uh, you know, donations or contributions to uh, these uh, zoo programs, which are, um, you know, uh, in place to uh, take care of these animals. And what it does is it takes pressure off wild populations by reducing the value of their feathers. Uh, so Cory Bustards are you know, poached uh, from, or wild Cory Bustards are, are poached um, for both their meat and their feathers. And their feathers are externally valuable. Um, uh, not only on the fly tying market, but also kind of on the, you know, uh, indigenous crafts and, you know, other venues, other crafts that I'm not familiar with. Uh, um, I have seen, like, Native American headdresses made out of Cory Bustard before. I'm not entirely certain the connection between, you know, an African roadrunner like bird and, and North American Native Americans, but uh, there's, I've, I've seen, you know, you know, the, the kind of the headdress of the, what we would, I guess, stereotypically call like a war bonnet uh, made but I'm not entirely certain on the connection. Um, maybe uh, maybe somebody can comment in chat uh, or the co comment section uh, if they know, because I don't. Um, but anyway, this program uh, ha um, is is trying to reduce the pressure on wild populations from poaching by making it uh, less financially. Uh, um, desirable to hunt them for their feathers. Um, now, it might, it probably doesn't do anything for people who hunt them for food, for their meat. Um, but, you know. Uh, now, I've had, heard rumblings of some changes in the program, so I'm going to have to follow up with um, either John or somebody in the program to see what's going on. Uh, I don't know what's going on if there are changes being made. So, you know, again, if uh, somebody wants to put in the comments, if they know anything better, because um, I, I, I just haven't followed up uh, with anyone. Okay, so I have all of my components laid out. Um, bronze Mallard, Cory Bustard, and I'm just going to lay... The Cory Bustard, eh, I don't know if you can see. I'm going to lay the Cory Bustard on top of the Bronze Mallard. And then I'm going to do the same for the all the other components are just going to get laid on top. Uh, stacked, stacked up. Uh, including the peacock, peacock wing. And it doesn't have to be a neat stack because this is all just going to get tied in. And then I'm going to take my dubbing needle, and once it's tied in, I'm going to run it all through. But I have this like stack here. I'm going to place it down carefully. Use my scissors to hold it down. 
And I'm going to stack up the other side. So this is the the far wing or the the right hand wing or the wing that's closest to you, the the viewer, the the camera. I'm just going to stack it up. And mostly, I'm 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 being careful to align the tips as best as I can, but you know. The other thing I'm trying to be careful of is to, to stack everything in the same order. Just so the wings mirror each other as best as possible. But again, not nothing terribly precise. Not, you know. Again, this is a mixed wing. So it's specifically called to be a mixed wing and not a built wing. So there you go, second stack. And then I'm going to carefully take the two stacks. And line up the tips and stack them all back to back. Looks like a mess. It is a mess. It's supposed to be a mess. Tie it in here. Just gonna do a half softish loop just to make sure everything doesn't shift. Give it a couple wraps. Now, in order to bring the wing up against the 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 throat, you can give it a slight pull, tug, and that'll help shift the thread thread wraps back towards the the throat. Great. Um, I'm going to unwrap a couple of wraps here. As usual, wax my thread. Take two turns just to lock that the so it doesn't shift backwards or forwards because this is you know despite the fact that I, I tied some in some very sparse slips you know three fibers two fibers of things uh, this is actually a fairly bulky wing <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna lock, try and lock it in as much as I can before trimming so that it doesn't you know shift or continue to shift <laughs> Trimming. And then I'm going to trim it on a taper. And then I'm going to use the wax thread to bind down the butts. Okay, and I'm going to bring the, the thread back to the tying point on the wing. We're going to tie in the macaw and the wood duck feelers. Wood duck is unlikely to be feelers in any pattern, but hey. Um, I'm just going to use a couple of skinny, skinny slips of wood duck. Actually, before I put the wood duck in, uh, now that the wing's bound down, I'm just going to take my dubbing needle and I'm going to tease the wing in two. Some single strands, and then I'm going to just generally pull them back so that they lightly, lightly, lightly marry back to each other. I'm going to add the wood duck as if it were a side, just, just a couple of slips. Um,
Now I'm going to tie in the feelers. Um, feelers is how you is how Blacker or what Blacker calls what we modern day in modern day tying we'd call them horns. Um, or like if you were uh, uh, looking through a like a a, a hardy recipe. I think he also calls them horns, uh, but Blacker calls them feelers because they kind of resemble like antennae. Nothing fancy. Okay, I'm going to trim everything up at the head. And I'm going to wax the thread and then I'm going to tie in the hurl for the the head. Now, I, I probably don't need to do a hurl head um, on all of these flies, but I like hurl heads and I cannot lie. Um, I also like hurl butts, but, you know, <laughs> none of these patterns call for a butt. Um, some of them, some of the other patterns do, but not any of the ones for the river band. Okay, uh, use my favorite hackle pliers, these kind of nice swivelly ones to help me wrap it. Um, I'm just going to sweep the, the fibers to the rear. I'm not folding it all the way. I'm just making sure that none of the hackle, none of the Curl fibers get trapped going forward because that would look unsightly. Um, one of the reasons why I like putting hurl heads on things is that it helps disguise, you know, if I haven't quite got my tie-ins right on top of each other, um, it helps disguise, you know, <laughs> the extra thread gap created when that happens. Okay. Gonna tie in one more wrapper curl if I can get it out of this piece. No, I don't think so. Okay, just gonna tie it in underneath. One wrap there. Okay. All right, so that's, that's a nice tidy head, and I'm just going to whip finish. And that'll be the number one for the river band. Tied on a very nice partridge CS26 yes, hook. Oh, I saw something shift there. It's just extra fuzzy. 
Okay. So, uh, like usual, um, I will. Yeah. Uh, I will get some headsmen on it, but here's the number one for the river band from Blacker's Art of Flymaking. Um, thanks for hanging out with me today. Uh, again, just a reminder, uh, trying to reach 500 followers on Instagram. And uh, I'll, when I hit 500, I'll be doing a giveaway. Uh, I will be streaming next weekend, uh, Saturday at my normal time. Uh, but then the following Saturday, March 14th, I will be at the Maryland Fly Fishing and Collectible Tackle Show uh, in Towson, uh, up by Baltimore. Uh, come say hi. Um, what else? Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Uh, if you want to purchase flies for me, uh, you know, per buying flies for me is is the way to support the channel. It helps keep this uh, hobby of mine uh, self funded, uh, so they can keep tying flies for you guys and and demonstrating at shows. Um, you know, uh, you can head over to my Etsy shop. Uh, it's Studio One Two One Three. You can find flies um, over there, and you can also find these uh, magnetic. Uh, display boxes. Um, these are, are great for storing your flies. Uh, they are, I will say they are a little bit more expensive on Etsy because these are not inexpensive to ship. Uh, the best place, if you want the best deal on these fly boxes, uh, come find me at a show. Uh, you don't have to pay shipping. There's a discount because there's a massive discount because I don't have to pay shipping. Um, but they are magnetic. They hold your flies securely. Uh, they're a good way to display classic flies. Um, they're they're meant for larger flies. Uh, here's another example. Um, they're just made out of upcycled cigar boxes, and uh, yeah, they hold flies securely uh, nicely. Um, so that's another way you can help support the channel by by buying those um at, yeah. and like i said i suggest buying those for me at shows because i don't have to pay shipping you don't have to pay shipping everybody goes home happy um and oh the fly boxes are 45 dollars at shows and i think they're 60 dollars on my etsy again because shipping um there's a little bit of price difference between different boxes based on the number of magnets i have to use um and the again, and these are not inexpensive magnets. They're like the really strong, uh, like neodymium or rare earth magnets, uh, and that allows me to use a thicker covering over the magnets, like felt. Um, other than that, yeah, uh, there are flies on uh, in the Etsy shop, both Mary Orvis Marbury flies and classic Atlantic salmon flies. Uh, I don't think I'll be selling any more of my freestyle flies on Etsy just because I, they don't get a whole lot of attention, uh, but they will be up for sale at shows. Uh, if you see, if, um, you know, one of my freestyle flies you see on my Instagram or, or on the Etsy, uh, or no longer on the Etsy, um, they'll be available at shows. So uh, with that, thanks for hanging out. Um, hopefully see you guys at the Maryland Fly Fishing Show and uh, have a good one.